is raising the capacity for knowledge and innovation and nurture first-class mentality. So Lincoln has a big role to play here. Yeah? When we talk about capacity for knowledge, innovation, research, producing the graduates, huh? and all that. Number three, trust number three is addressing persistent social economic inequalities constructively and productively. Yeah? So we're also trying to make sure, as you know, uh, Malaysia uh, has got you know, the Sabah Sarawak, uh, which um, not so densely populated as in the West uh, Peninsula, but we are trying to send also more and more medical and healthcare professionals to work there. Yeah? So we're trying to reach every corner of the country, you know, make it equity yeah, for um, the Malaysians or you know, foreigners living in Malaysia to be able to have access to healthcare. Yeah? So we are working very hard on this. Um, trust number four is improving the standard and sustainability of quality of life. Now here is another very important trust. When we say quality of life, yeah, healthcare is very important. Yeah? Um, besides uh, longevity, we must have quality of life. Yeah? Now currently, the life expectancy um, in Malaysia, of course, has gone up. Yeah? Um, for males, uh, currently, it's 72.5 years old. And for female, female always have uh, more years. Uh, Female is 77.1, yeah, life expectancy. So it's a figure of 72.5 versus 70.1. Good to have people living longer. In fact, in Japan, they live even longer <laughs> still. But um, quality of life is very important. Yeah? When we say quality of life, such a big word, right? So many aspects to look into. And um, you know, if you have someone like stroke, you know, the effects of stroke, and then lying down, and someone who has been very active in the past suddenly, you know? so imagine uh, all this. So, um, so the healthcare of Malaysia, uh, we are now, uh, Ministry of Health is uh, charting the directions. Uh, in the past, we have um, spent a lot of money, you know, spent a lot of effort on the treatment, the curative part aspect. Yeah? We are doing very well. Uh, as the year goes by, we see our specialists, our doctors are doing very well. Uh, uh, advancement in the technology uh, of uh, medical care and all that. But we are now trying to direct some attention to the promotion preventive. Uh, with the treatment still going on, it's continuing to excel, but capture also the rehabilitation part. So these are the, uh, I repeat again, promotion, preventive, and rehabilitation with the treatment still in place. Because we find that we are spending uh, more and more on treatment. Yeah? With obesity yeah? uh, increasing, it's very scary. Yeah? And obesity comes with not just plain obesity, you will have hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, you have diabetes, you know. And then once you have diabetes, you will have what? All the complications of diabetes. Retinopathy, nephropathy, uh, neuropathy, and all that. So the like most uh, developing countries and developed countries, uh, so Malaysia is facing uh, the challenge of having a double disease burden uh, where communicable and non-communicable coexist. Yeah. So um, we are trying to do our best. Yeah. So in education-wise also, knowing the direction, the education sector also need yeah, to flow along and support yeah, the healthcare directions, recognizing the need to uh, spend more effort and also money into promotion, preventive, and also rehabilitative. So the prevalence of non-communicable diseases continue to rise in Malaysia. And in fact, in Malaysia, uh, we have the highest among the Asian countries. That's not very good news, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, obesity too. Eh? Uh, it is so difficult for people to try and eat less, or, or not say eat less, but eat the right amount that is uh, you know, suitable for your body size. Yeah, your BMI, your fat, uh, adipose tissue in your you know, body and all that. But it's so difficult because even to drive people to exercise more is so, such a big challenge. But of course, we noted that um, we need to have proper facilities uh, around uh, and also uh, safe walking places, safe places for exercising, all that also. Uh, uh. And therefore, the, in the 2011 National Health and Mobility Survey, yeah, 
20, we find that uh, it has shown that the prevalence of diabetes among adults, uh, those who are more than 18 years in Malaysia, has increased from 11.6% in the year 2006 to 15.2% in 2011. So this is very scary, actually. Now, in which prevalence of diabetes for adults who are aged 30 years and above also has gone up. Eh? It's gone up to um, 20, from 20.8% 20 in 2011. Yeah? Uh, and before this, it was 14.9% uh, in the year 2006. The prevalence of hypertension also has increased from 32.2 in 2006 to the current um, 32.7%. And then we have the prevalence of hypercholesterolemia, yeah? Has also doubled uh, in the space of five years, from 20.7 in 2006, yeah? In the current prevalence of 32.6, um, uh, which is an increase of 57.5. So all these already show us uh, the evidence. These are all, you know, from the findings. Uh, and uh, therefore, the whole healthcare, yeah? has to address uh, some of these uh, issues. Now, Malaysia is um, currently, uh, we are coming to the end of our 10th Malaysia plan. Uh, it will end in the next year, 2015. And in 2016, we'll start our 11th yeah, Malaysia plan. So, Ministry of Health is now uh, currently working very hard uh, to chart the direction for another five years. Yeah? We're looking at, um, you know, utilizing all aspects. Uh, the doctors, the, the medical doctors, the dentists, the pharmacists, eh, nurses. How can we all work together eh, jointly? Um, gone are the days when people tend to work on their own and in silos. Yeah? We, we cannot continue that way. Eh? Whatever a medical and healthcare professional you are, you need to come together, yeah? work as a team. Because um, you cannot manage patients alone. Yeah? You look at the hospital, there are so many kinds of professionals there. And also, um, everybody needs to have a caring heart. Yeah? When you look at medical and healthcare, yeah? you must have a caring heart. Uh, uh, and also, you must be able to um, also uh, have your soft skills developed. Yeah? How to be communicate with people, communicate with one another. Sometimes we have a lot of knowledge in our head. Yeah? Very current knowledge, very good. But you know, the working relationship, very important. Yeah? So I believe in the... Uh, at your uh, Lincoln University College here, uh, in the training of your graduates, I'm sure emphasis is given eh, to this area, communication skills, how to work together, networking and all that. So I would like to congratulate you once again on this team eh, that you have chosen, Contemporary Healthcare. So it's very important, healthcare has developed, evolved so much. What are the latest, what are the current, what are the needs, you know? Yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, graduates we need to produce? Eh? What kind of uh, content in the curriculum we need to put in to be able to produce someone that is able to serve? Yeah? Whether you work in Malaysia or whether you work in any part of the country, yeah, you must have a heart to serve the people. Yeah? Now, the health science research eh, is important and... Um, if you are to deliver yeah, on the expectations, uh, you must recognize that um, it can't be done here only, but we are a part of a global system, yeah? a global effort, working together as um, you know, a big team. And then you need to contribute and to draw from the global stock of knowledge. And you definitely play a very important role yeah? in the helping to shape eh, our country and also individual countries in the area of research that various countries can excel in their own expertise or in their own focus area. So to secure a successful future for Malaysia, we need to have an education system that values the pursuit of knowledge and critical thinking. Universities and colleges play a crucial role here in attracting young people to be educated and to be trained with proper skills, 
in the various science and non-science field and to be a good researcher as well and influencing their career direction. And I'm sure that Lincoln University College will be one of the leading education providers in this country to make our nation be proud of producing one of the best professionals, researchers, academicians. And this conference organized by Lincoln University College is proving that University College is dedicated to provide ex an excellent platform for all of you to come and share your knowledge and your innovations, your innovative ideas to the new generation as well as among all the expertise. If we wish to build a healthy lifestyle, we have to draw on the knowledge and capacity of all as a matter of global priority. Only by drawing on the expertise, the creativity and knowledge of all our health science disciplines and medical, dental, then only will we be able to meet the challenges we face and into the future to secure a healthier and prosperous future for the new generation. So finally, I would like to um, congratulate again to say that um, well done for this conference. Yeah? I'm sure a lot of hard work have been uh, put into, not easy. Yeah? And wish you another great success for next year. Yeah? And uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. And from the Ministry of Health, I s we send you our congratulations and thank you from the Ministry of Health and also from the Director General of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. But we would like you to remain on stage for a while. Thank you very much for the speech. Thank you very much for sharing the information in terms of policies and direction of healthcare industry in the country. I really appreciate the sound, uh, what you were saying, that, that we should be sharing, caring, lastly, loving each other. I think that's the end of it. Because we need to love every one of us so that we develop the passion together. So with that, I would like to call upon Number uh, Bahagia Datuk Dr. Haji Bibi Florina Abdullah uh, to present uh, our appreciation uh, to Yang Bahagia Datuk uh, Tan Yok Hua. Please welcome. And also to prove the ladies' powers of the new generation. Right? <laughs> Give applause, please. Again, thank you very much to Yang Bahagia Datuk Dr. B.B. Florina and also Yang Bahagia Datuk Tan Yokwa. Ladies and gentlemen, we will move to the next uh, session. Uh, but based on what was mentioned by Yang Bahagia Datuk Tan just now about the increase in the percentage of diabetes in the country, we have taken the step to delay the tea so that we'll sort of do some amount of prevention in terms of diabetic control, since I was informed that we had all had good breakfast this morning. So with that ado, uh, please uh, bear with us. Uh, we will just delay the tea so that uh, that will create a better percentage, hopefully, and a better lifestyle. <laughs> Next, we proceed with our uh, one of the highlights of this conference. We would like to call upon Professor Dr. Chandrakran Kokate, Vice Chancellor of KLE University, Belgao, India, to preside the next session and invite our honorable guest, uh, Nobel Laureate Professor Emeritus Dr. Harold Zohausen. Please welcome, Professor. Good morning. I deem it a great honor to chair the session addressed by the Nobel Laureate, Professor Emeritus Dr. Harald Zur Hausen, an internationally acclaimed virologist. I have great pleasure in introducing to you our distinguished speaker, 
Professor Emeritus Dr. Harald Zur Hausen. He was born on March 11, 1936 in Gelsenkirchen, Bayer, Germany. He studied medicine at the universities of Bonn, Hamburg, Düsseldorf and received his MD in 1960. After his internship, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Microbiology in Düsseldorf and subsequently in the virus laboratories of the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, where he was later appointed as assistant professor. After a period of three years as a senior scientist at the Institute of Virology of the University of Würzburg, he was appointed in 1972 as chairman and professor of virology at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg. In 1977, he moved to a similar position at the University of Freiburg. From 1983 until 2003, he held the post of scientific director of the Dosches Krebsforschungszentrum German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg. He retired from this position in 2003. Professor Emeritus Dr. Hausen has received a number of national and international awards. Among them, the Robert Koch Prize, the Charles S. Mott Prize of General Motors Cancer Research Foundation, the Federation of the European Cancer Society's Clinical Research Award, the Paul Ehrlich Ludwig Darmstadter Prize, the Jung Prize, Hamburg, the Charles Rodolf Brubacher Prize, Zurich, the Prince Mahidol Award, Bangkok, the Raymond Borgin Award, Paris, the Coley Award, New York, the Life Science Achievement Award of the American Association for Cancer Research, San Diego, the German Special Order of Merit with Star, the Sungwing II Award, and the greatest of all, Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2008. He has received 25 honorary MD and PhD doctorates from universities across the globe. He is an elected member of various academies, such as German National Academy, Leopoldina, Heidelberg Academy of Sciences, Polish Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine of Venezuela, American Philosophical Society, Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, USA, foreign member of the US National Academy of Sciences and research organizations such as MGO, Hugo. And he became an honorary member of a number of biomedical scientific societies. A large number of special lectures and visiting professorships, memberships in editorial boards and active involvements in the organization of international meetings complement his curriculum. In April 2013, Harald Zurzhausen was elected into the first class of the fellows of the American Association for Cancer Research, AACR, of the AACR Academy, Philadelphia, USA. From January 2000, to December 2009, Sur Hausen was editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Cancer and from 2006 to 2010, he was a member of the board of directors of the International Union Against Cancer. From 2003 to 2010, he was vice president of the German National Academy for Natural Sciences and Medicine, Leopoldina in Halle. Since 2006, he has been a member of the Scientific Council of the National Science and Technology Development Agency in Bangkok, Thailand, and from 2010 to 12, chairman of this council. We are indeed very fortunate to have such a great internationally acclaimed scientist in midst of us delivering a special address. Having gone through his brief biodata, I 
feel that it's a big honor to this conference to have such a distinguished person as one of the speakers i request all of you to give standing ovation to professor emeritus dr harald zurhausen well thank you very much dr kokata it's really a great pleasure to be here uh vice chancellor dr bomat pro chancellor dr abdallah distinguished members of the universities who are here as guests and the members of the government ladies and gentlemen it's for me a great pleasure to be here and it's my third visit to this beautiful country and it's clearly a very enjoyable one what i'm planning to do today is to discuss with you some of the very recent developments and what something which we consider as a very interesting relatively novel research program which is trying to link specific types of infections with human cancers and also with chronic human diseases now um, can i move the slides here next slide please how can i do it we do know at present that something like 21% of the human of the global cancer incidence is linked to infections and this slide lists those types of infections which are known to be linked to some of them to very common human cancers these are not only viral infections but also parasitic infections bacterial infections but clearly viruses play about the, the major role by covering two thirds of the infections which are presently linked to human cancers now the discovery of infectious agents linked to human cancers obviously had important consequences already at present in two directions in three directions i should better say namely first of all in new novel attempts for prevention secondly in assessing patients at risk for specific types of of uh, cancers and uh, certainly also to new novel approaches in the therapy of well, therapeutic approaches in a way as prevention of specific types of cancer let me very briefly allude to it we know that we do have two types of virus infections causing widespread human cancers hepatitis b and liver cancer and the high risk human papilloma viruses particularly for cancer of the cervix where we do have vaccinations available preventive vaccinations which in the case of hepatitis b have been proven already specifically in taiwan initially to be to prevent liver cancer in the case of the high risk papilloma virus infections we know that the vaccination is preventing the precursor lesions of cervical cancer the time which elapsed since the introduction of the of the vaccine usually in many countries in 2006 does not yet permit to make a statement that it prevented cervical cancer as well although this is extremely likely to happen although we will have to wait for probably something like 10 or 15 more years before statistically significant results become available but there are two other infections in particular hepatitis c virus infection and the human immunodeficiency virus infections where novel modes of of treatment for hepatitis c specifically is a treatment of persistent infection even persisting for decades already permits the elimination of the agent and probably will lead to prevention of another important carcinogen for the development of liver cancer in the case of human immunodeficiency viruses the uh, reduction of the load of the virus by the highly active antiretroviral therapy the so called hard therapy permits already right now the statement that this type of treatment prevents some of the cancers linked to the immunosuppression caused by these types of viruses and these are mainly kaposi sarcomas and b cell lymphomas which in the majority of instances are caused by epstein chronic epstein barr virus infections which become reactivated under those conditions and parasitic infections and also bacterial infections can be approached therapeutically either by chemotherapy in the case of parasites 
or by antibiotics in the case of Helicobacter pylori, the main agent for gastric cancer. And in these cases, again, it should be preventive, although unfortunately this type of treatment does not leave an immunity behind. So those patients who get rid of the respective um, bacteria or parasites will later on be susceptible for novel infections by the same agents again. But basically we have this situation right now. In the case of high-risk papilloma viruses, I should add that we need to vaccinate prior to the onset of sexual activity because these viruses are almost exclusively transmitted by sexual contacts, which means in age groups between usually 9 to 14 years of age for girls, and it is important to consider also the vaccination of boys of the same age groups, not only because they are transmitters later on of the virus, but also because some cancers occur in males as well, like oropharyngeal cancers and also anal cancers, at least at higher frequency than in females um, many times. Next slide, please. But what I would like to discuss with you today is something else, namely, besides these 21% of cancers which we can link to infections, do there exist additional widespread human cancers, in part widespread human cancers, which may be linked to infectious events as well? Is there some epidemiological evidence that some of these cancers may have uh, some links to infections? Now, I listed here four points, which I've discussed at many other occasions. Cancers occurring at increased frequency and immunosuppression, we know, of course, that organ allograft recipients, as well as HIV, as Im human immunodeficiency virus-infected patients, that they acquire cancers which are mainly due to infectious events, such as Kaposi sarcomas, which I mentioned a moment ag ago, the B cell lymphomas, Merkel cell, uh, cancer cells, and so on. But there's still a couple of cancers which are increased under immunosuppression, which so far have not been linked to infectious events. Take, for instance, thyroid cancer, a couple of other cancers as well, which are increased uh, substantially. Some of the lymphomas are increased under those conditions where we don't know at this stage whether infectious events play a role. I'm not going to discuss this in any further detail. But the other aspect which is quite interesting and that I will bring up a little bit more extensively, namely cancers with reduced incidence under immunosuppression. There are certain cancers where immunosuppression shows a protective effect against cancer, and one of the major cancers in this respect is human breast cancer. Human breast cancer in uh, uh, patients with, which receive organ allograft or which are infected by AIDS viruses, this usually show a 15% reduced incidence of the respective form of, of breast cancer in comparison to non-immunocompromised controls. So this is an interesting point. There are a few other cancers which should be mentioned here, but I may come to them if the time permits it at least very quickly later on. There are certain cancers which are influenced by other basically non-carcinogenic infections, and these are mainly cancers which occur in early childhood. B-cell lymphoblastic leukemias, brain tumors in childhood, and also neuroblastomas. These are tumors which are obviously influenced by, uh, negatively influenced, by the occurrence of multiple infections during the first year of life. These are non-specific infections by various agents, usually respiratory tract infections, but yet they show a protective effect in, uh, if one looks into the incidence of these cancers in children acquiring those infections frequently in comparison to others which have them rarely. Now, again, this point I will not dwell on at, in this talk because it would clearly require an additional topic to discuss it more in detail. But the last point I will discuss in more detail, namely nutritional cancer risk factors, which are possibly linked to infection. Next slide, please. Now, the idea came really from uh, the observations that we know a number of human viruses which persist in humans for lifetime, many of them for lifetime, and are sometimes excreted and in, in the sputum or also in the urine, 
like the polyoma viruses BK and JC, about 60% of the adult population becomes infected by them without, commonly without any symptoms uh, at all, or the human adenoviruses type 12, 18, or 31, which are uh, also persistent infections for quite, in quite a number of people. Epstein-Barr virus and high-risk papilloma viruses, of course, under certain circumstances, so rarely cause cancers, but uh, it's still a rare event that it happens. Now, those types of agents, particularly the polyoma viruses and the adenoviruses, are, as far as we know, non-tumorigenic, non-carcinogenic in humans, yet if you transmit them to species which, in which they cannot replicate, where they become replication incompetent, they induce very actively cancer. This is, for instance, the case in rodent cells. This is the case for the uh, JC virus that has been shown to cause the gliomas in owl monkeys and a couple of other species which I didn't list here. So basically, if you have a situation of replication incompetence, where only specific genes of the viruses can be expressed, but not the total virus replication cycle takes place, then they have suddenly become carcinogenic. So this triggered the idea, is it possible that there also exists something in the opposite direction, namely that many of the domestic animals with which we live in close neighborhood, or from which we consume at least a number of, of uh, products or even the meat, that they may have a similar situation, being infected latently by agents in which they can, which they can replicate in these animals, which never cause cancer in these animals, or at least not as far as we know, but if transmitted to another species in which they cannot replicate, in this case to humans, is it possible that they can cause cancer? So that was the basic idea behind this, a lot of experimentation. Next slide, please. Uh, and the prime target initially was clearly colon cancer because there are a large number of reports right now that colon cancer occurs particularly at higher frequency in uh, populations consuming on long period of time what is called red, red or processed meat. Processed meat means smoked, air-dried meat or something like this. And uh, this seems to account particularly for beef countries with the highest rate of red meat consumption, they're listed here, uh, particular European countries, the uh, United States, North American countries, Argentina, Uruguay, and so on, New Zealand, and Australia, they have a very high rate of colon cancer. Next slide, please. Now, for quite a long time, it was assumed that the reason for this is very clear. Namely, in the end of the 1980s, Sugimura and his colleagues in Tokyo analyzed some products which arise in the cooking, broiling, grilling, barbecuing process of red meat, on, of meat in general, and uh, finding that there exist some chemical, uh, like some chemical compounds developing like uh, aromatic hydrocarbons and a couple of other compounds which are listed here which when isolated and applied to rodents, for instance, are indeed highly carcinogenic and can induce tumors. Also, the doses which are commonly applied are about 1,000 to 10,000 10, fold higher than those which are produced in our uh, procedures for preparing meat for consumption. Well, it would fit very well to the whole story. Next slide. If there wouldn't be a few things which do not fit too well into the into this, namely so-called white meat, if you broil, barbecue, grill, chicken or fish, they produce basically the same chemical carcinogens at relatively high concentrations and some instances even at higher concentrations than you find it in a barbecued steak. So uh, this is in, in a way not easily compatible with the explanation that red meat causes cancer due to these chemical carcinogens. Next one, please. Now, if you look carefully into the epidemiological situation globally of colon cancer incidence, and here in particular the red areas or the reddish areas indicate those areas where you have a high incidence of colon cancer, you can see that it seems to, it's suggestive that it has something to do 
with the spreading of uh, dairy beef and dairy meat. And there are a few rather remarkable exceptions from this whole rule because, for instance, Mongolia is one of the countries which I'm going to discuss a little bit more because that is supposed to eat the highest, one of the highest amounts of red to consume, the highest amount of red meat per person and population, and yet they have an extremely low rate of colon cancer. India has one of the lowest rates of colon cancer globally. Uh, Bolivia, interestingly, in South America is a country which has a low rate of colon cancer, and the st statistics seem to be fairly good, and this also accounts for the situation in equatorial Africa. Now, if you look at it from a viewpoint or from the hypothesis that beef consumption plays a role, then it's almost inescapable to come to the conclusion that it is not beef uh, as such, but it must be a very specific type of, of beef which uh, should be responsible for this. And this should be our typical European, Asian type of dairy cattle because wherever this is widely spread and being consumed, the rate of colon cancer seems to be rather remarkably high. Whereas in other countries, I'll come back to Mongolia and India in a moment, uh, and also in equatorial Africa, where different types of, spe different species of beefs are being mainly bred and being consumed, seem to have l low risk of the respective types of infection. Next one, please. Now, I became a specialist in cattle in the meantime, and here are some, some of the pictures which uh, seem to be, have some relevance to what I'm talking about. The uh, Bostaurus-derived meats, those which beef, which de are derived from the Aurox in Asia and, and Europe, uh, are the ancestors of our uh, dairy cattle. Zebus are different species of, of cattle, which split relatively early from the, from the taurines. And the uh, Vatusi cattle in Africa, the, uh, are closely, they are closely related, as I will dwell in a moment on, uh, to the zebus, the water buffaloes, and the yaks are different species of cattle. Next slide, please. Well, here we have the uh, incidence of colorectal cancer in Southeast Asia. And it's interesting to note on the left side, Mongolia with a very low rate and with a low mortality of colorectal cancer. Uh, the uh, Malaysia is somewhat intermediate in its range between the high-risk countries here like, uh, like Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, uh, Brunei, Singapore with a relatively high incidence of this type of cancer at all. At all. No, next slide, please. Uh, here in Malaysia, you keep mainly a specific type of cattle, the so-called Keda Kelantan cattle, if I pronounce them correctly. Uh, they are a bread which was or originating from, from crossing short, uh, shorthorn cattle with zebus. And if you look at them genetically, they are mainly of zebu origin. They are very closely related in spite of the fact that some of the mitochondrial DNA is still of the original shorthorn uh, origin. Next slide, please. Uh, in, in Mongolia, the situation is somewhat different because here in Mongolia, specific types of cattle existed. They were not dairy cattle, but they were only produced for, for meat, meat consumption. And they have been crossed subsequently mainly by uh, Chinese yellow cattle, which also have a very strong zebu background at the same time. And the breed which orig originated uh, from this right now is very prevalent. But besides this, in Mongolia, they have a large population of yaks, a different species of the, of the dairy cattle, of, the, uh, of cattle in general. Next slide, please. Distantly related. Now, the red meat consumption in Mongolia is remarkably high, as I mentioned it before. The beef, before 1960, it was mainly yak meat, and also the uh, original uh, cattle which was kept there, and now the, the, most of the cattle are hybrids and yak meat as well. Uh, it's counting for about 40 to 50% of the consumption, 
mutton and goat, camel meat, horse meat is being consumed at a relatively higher frequency and as it is